We're ready to begin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Hands, and I'm the uh, Supplier Diversity Program Manager for the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. I'm also the Chairman of the Board of Directors for the Chicago MSDC. Welcome to our first virtual MBE to MBE exchange uh, during our uh, Federal Reserve Signature Supplier Diversity Initiative called Business Smart Week. This is our eighth year of Business Smart Week, and I'm proud to partner with the Chicago MSDC and the Council's MBIC Committee on this initiative. Our supplier diversity program serves as a value generating partner to the business community by convening experts to transfer knowledge and provide you with the tools to better manage your business. Supplier diversity aligns directly with the Federal Reserve's mission to foster a strong economy and maximize employment as diverse businesses help to support the economic base in the communities in which they do business. This year's Business Smart Week focuses on helping business, businesses during this unprecedented time with information and smart strategies for you to gain access to opportunities. Over the nine and a half years while at the Federal Reserve, we have hosted numerous meetings exploring the obstacles small businesses face in gaining access to capital and credit. But clearly one of the most important issues facing minority businesses today is deciding whether to stay in business, grow your business, or pivot to new business strategies. We are committed to supplier diversity and we value our relationship with the Chicago Minority Supplier Development Council, the Minority Business Input Committee, and would like to thank our new president and CEO Vince Williams and his staff, MBIC Chair Joyce Johnson and Jared Kelly of CI Media for helping put this program together today. Lastly, I want to thank all of you for attending. Um, as I mentioned, we have a new president and CEO named Vince Williams. Vince became our president effective July 1st, and he becomes the fifth president in more than 50 years of the council history. We are excited to have Vince as our new president and CEO, as we are confident that he will bring fresh new ideas and execute those ideas to support the entire supplier, supplier diversity ecosystem. Vince joins us from the YWCA Metropolitan of Chicago, where he served as Vice President of Economic Empowerment and Director of Illinois Small Business Development at the YWCA. He has over 25 years of executive level experience in corporate America and with large nonprofit organizations. So please welcome our next speaker, President and CEO, Vince Williams. Uh, thank you, Mark. I'd like to thank the Federal Reserve of Chicago for this outstanding opp opportunity and collaboration for CBOF 53 and Business Smart Week 2020. As Mark mentioned, we have an incredibly supportive board of directors here at Chicago MSDC, and I wanna thank each of them as well. So on behalf of the Chicago MSDC and Northwest Indiana MSDC staff, welcome. The council is very excited that you have chosen to join us today. We know that there are several opportunities for business development online these days but we hope you'll all continue to look to the council as a primary resource to connect and develop your business. We're introducing a new cadence for our value add in the business marketplace. We have an abundance of tools and resources within our programs that include our MBDA business centers here in Chicago and St. Louis, Missouri that provide one-on-one -on -one advising, the MBDA export center and Discover Africa resources we just expanded our, our services under MDA CARES for training, education, and advising minority small businesses impacted by COVID-19. And we're proud of our partnership with the Illinois Tollway that helps to fund the Technical Assistance Center here at the Chicago MSDC. Another opportunity that we're proud to provide is the PIPE program that stands for Progress, Insight, and performance education. This is an eight week business training program that's currently accept, accepting applications for our cohort three that begins in the fall of 2020. Thanks to our incredible collaboration with Aramark, we're able to provide this training under a full $2,500 full scholarship, which means no out-of-pocket cost to our MBEs that are accepted to the program. So yes, please continue to engage with the council. We're laser focused on connecting the dots for business to business development, growth, and contracting in the marketplace. <laughs> connecting the dots. That's our theme for the 53rd annual 
Chicago Business Opportunity Fair. And it's forcing us all to think and perform differently. In fact, it's, today is a great example of how we convene under our virtual conference series. So please do us a favor, let us know how we're doing and share our upcoming programs, webinars on social media by using the hashtag CBOF53. I would also like to thank our presenting sponsor, Allstate. And a special thank you to CBOF 53 planning committee, partners, producers like CEI Media Group who helped us produce all of the CBOF 53 events. And lastly, I want to thank our three honorary chairs of CBOF 53, Rona Forte with United Airlines, Sue Batija with Rose International, and Joyce Johnson with Anchor Staffing. Joyce is not only one of our phenomenal certified MBEs, but she also volunteers her time for one of our committees. She serves as the chair of the Minority Business Enterprise Input Committee, or MBEIC. This committee focuses on advocacy for minority businesses. We appreciate you, Joyce, and thank you for all that you do for the council. So it's my pleasure to introduce Joyce Johnson, President and CEO of Anchor Staffing. Enjoy the conference. Thank you, Vince. It continues to be an honor to serve as the chair of the Minority Business Enterprise Input Committee for Chicago MSDC. The MBIC provides valuable input to the council stakeholders with regard to issues and concerns that affect minority business owners. It is a pleasure to welcome you as this virtual business smart to this virtual business smart week. I am excited about the programs that the council team and the Federal Reserve staff have lined up. Virtual workshops that provide business owners with information that bridge about bridging the digital gap. A discussion about how this pandemic has impacted business strategies to maximize MBE certification and then receive tips on how to pitch your business with technology are sessions that opportune. I will be tuned in. As the chair of the MBEIC, I encourage each of you to tune in as well. It is imperative that we all evolve into the new normal of business together. Thank you and welcome and enjoy. Thank you, Vince and Joyce. Um, now our first speaker is gonna be talking, his topic is bridging the post COVID digital divide. Our speaker comes all the way from Nashville. Um, his name is Lashane Greenhill. He's the CEO and founder of Sales Cocktail. Um, prior to his current ventures, he, uh, he, he was uh, attending, he attended Memphis University and he, uh, he is, uh, serves as president and chairman of the Nashville Area Junior Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he is a facilitator for the Kauffman Foundation Fast Track Program. He's also helped design and facilitate a 10 week entrepreneurship program for New Level Community Development Corporation. In 2005, a graduate of Nashville Emerging Leaders and a 2009 graduate of the Young Leaders Council, Lashane is also a member of the 2008 Leadership Nashville class. Nashville Business Journal named him the, a top 40 under 40 in 2010 and Power 100. In 2013, he was awarded the Spirit of the Chamber Award by the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, he's been a featured speaker for Chicago and the Kansas City Federal Reserve uh, Banks. Um, he's an uh, international business innovation associate, he's done speaking, Vanderbilt School of Engineering. It, the list goes on and on. So we are uh, happy to present Lashane Greenhill uh, as our first speaker. Thanks, Mark. And um, thank you, Dale. It's nice to join, rejoin you here uh, in this. And thanks to, to the Chicago NMSDC for uh, allowing me to speak. Look forward to to really hopefully sharing some helpful information uh, given the trying times that we're in right now. Some of you on this call may have heard me speak last year 
Mark had me in Chicago. Uh, I was up there twice, actually. I was up there with Mark at his conference, and then I also joined uh, Tanya Forte Lyons for the Blue Cross Conference. So some of the stuff you're going to hear today, well, let me back up. Not that. Let me say this. What you're going to hear today is a a more scaled down version of what you heard me speak about last year. It's more targeted, and it is around technology. So anyone who knows me knows that I fall into two buckets. I am a sales guy, B2B sales, and I'm a tech guy. Uh, today we're going to be talking about technology, particularly in this what we call the new normal, um, this COVID-19 world. There's a lot of things that are taking place, and we need to figure out as MWBEs, how do we take advantage of that? But more importantly, how do we use technology to help us take advantage of that? So that's what today's um, um, presentation is going to be about. So let's, two things I want to mention before we get into it. Number one, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. Unlike when I speak in person, I ask you to provide your questions throughout the conversation. Today, we're going to do something different. Because of time um, and that is virtual, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, I'm going to ask you for any questions you have in there. We're going to save those questions to the end of this presentation, and Jared or someone from his team would then uh, give me those questions at the end. And that's number one. Number two for housekeeping, if you want a copy of this presentation, right now text sales cocktail on your screen to 615-510-6364. All right, so SAS. This is what we're going to be talking about today, SaaS technology. And in, my, in the other presentation that I do, I, I start out with a question. And that question is, when did the Internet start? I'm not going to ask that question today because I normally give out door prizes for the person who can answer that question. Um, but in that opening, I talk about the Internet and the two lives that the Internet has. And the first life of the Internet came about around 1996. And that was the life where we were able to purchase stuff. And there were a lot of different technologies that came about. The second life of the Internet really evolved around 2004, maybe 2006. And that's when companies like Salesforce came about. And those companies, we call them SaaS, Software as a Service. Those are the companies that now we can use um, to help automate certain processes in our business, to help scale our business, um, and to reduce costs. And so we're going to focus today on the second part of the life of the Internet, and that life is the life around SaaS. But before we get into that, I, I want to show you some, some two questions um, that, that, that come from a brief, brief survey that I ran about two months ago. Um, on the next slide, you're going to see the first question. Well, sorry, not, not this slide. Let me back up. And before we get to those questions, in talking about SaaS, now go to the next slide for me, Jared. Keep it on the next slide. Yeah. So the, the big question for today when we're talking about SaaS is what does your tech stack look like? And we want to – I want you to really think through what technology do you currently use to help you cut the cost, sell more effectively, and run your operations more efficiently. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that a few weeks ago, about two months ago, I ran a survey with my database. And my database is full of nothing but MWBEs. And so I, I picked 50 companies. We got 35 responses, as you see. And what I wanted to do is really get an understanding from MWBEs what they thought about COVID-19 and how it was going to impact their business and their use of technology. So here's one of the questions. With the current COVID pandemic, will you be adopting more technology to sustain and grow your business? As, as you can see from the responses, 68% said yes, 8% said no, 22% said maybe. So let's, let me kind of walk through what, how I interpret these responses. For those 68% that said yes, 
I would like to say that those are companies that are enlightened. When I say enlightened, what I mean by that, and this is not to disparage the companies that said no, but what I mean by that is we are in a new way of doing business. COVID-19 has changed the way we're going to operate from this day forward. I do believe, however, that there are some things that we were doing before COVID-19, we will go back to doing. But there literally are some other things that we were not doing or we were doing a certain way before COVID that we're not going to go back to doing the same way. And so those companies that said 70% of the 70% that said that they would adopt technology, those are the companies that I believe now understand and are willing to adopt technology because they know moving forward how we've conducted business before is not going to be the same. The 8%, they fall in one or two buckets, in my assumption. Either they don't understand that things have currently changed and permanently changed, or they were ahead of the curve. They've already adopted technology. And so they're already operating at a level with technology that the 70% or 68% are not. And then the 22%, my interpretation of that, of those companies, is that they don't know if their tech stack the correct stack to grow and scale their business. That is my interpretation of this one question. But it's great to see that 68% are willing, one, to adopt, to look at new ways of doing business, and two, willing to adopt it. So this was a four-question survey that we ran. So I'm going to give you two of the four. This one is what I did is I I, I listed all the technologies that I thought were important, you know, to run our business. And I wanted to see out of the 50 responses or 35 responses, which technologies did these companies believe were the most important for them to operate their business. And what I've done is I put green arrows beside four. Those are the four that I figured would rise to the top, Um, and we're going to talk about three of those four. But what surprised me about this is those two yellow arrows. So only 1% or 2%, one person said that that, that cloud technology was important to them to sustain and grow their business. And only one person also said video conferencing. Out of 35 people, one person said video conferencing is important for them to sustain and grow their business. And here we are today, and we're doing a virtual conference. My assumption is that everyone on this call, at least once a week, if not once a day, you're having some type of video conference. So it was surprising to me to see that only one person out of 35 said that video conferencing was important to them. Video conferencing is the new normal. I'm not saying that we're not going to go back to meeting in person. I've met in person in the last two or three weeks, of course, six feet apart. Um, uh, But I've met in person in the last, you know, two or three weeks several times. But the reality is we do have to get comfortable um, with video conferencing. One on there that I did not put a green arrow by that I should have put a green arrow by was the CRM or email marketing. Or two of them actually, email marketing at 14% or 40% and lead generation at 42%. We're going to touch on the lead generation too. Uh, I'm not going to cover all of these technologies. What I've done for today, and if you've seen me present before on this topic, you've seen me present on probably 15 to 20 different SaaS technologies. We don't have the time for that today. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to highlight certain areas of SaaS and then the different technologies that fit under those four areas. That's where we're going to go today. So why SaaS? I can sit up and tell you SaaS, why SaaS? Because it's cheap. I can tell you because it's just the new normal. When I say new normal, I'm not talking about the new normal with COVID. It's been the new normal for but for the last decade. That's the reality of it. I can say why SaaS, uh, because it's easier to um, 
it's easier to gain access to no matter where you are in the world. I can say all of that. There are a lot of reasons why SaaS, but those are not the real reasons why you should adopt SaaS. The next slide is the other real reasons. Reason number one, companies who adopt SaaS technology, a study shows that was done by Microsoft, that companies who adopt SaaS technology generally see an increase of 25% in their revenue. Now, the last five months, just about everyone has saw a decrease in their revenue. Hopefully coming out of this, we can get back to par and, and grow. One reason why you should adopt SaaS is because it has the ability. I'm not saying that if you do adopt it, that you're going to see an increase of 25%. But what I am saying is there is a great possibility that by you using SaaS technology, you can increase your bottom line revenue. The second reason in the same study showed that companies who adopted SaaS technology, software as a service, generally saved around 725 million hours in work hours. That is a whole lot of time. That is a whole lot of productivity that has been increased. So companies, let me repeat that. Companies who adopted SaaS technologies, and I'm talking about not only SaaS on your laptop. Everyone has a phone. I'm talking about the use of apps. Companies who generally adopt those type of technologies, it shows that in one year, I think this survey was 2018, those type of technologies saved over 725 million work hours just from companies using app, apps. And then the fourth reason, or the third reason why I say you should adopt SaaS is because that same study showed that those same companies reduced their workload by 42%. So if I take out the fact that it's cheap, if I take out the fact that it's easily accessible, we could take that off the table. These numbers here are the reasons why you should adopt SaaS. 25% increase in revenue, over 700 million hours in workload saved, and a decrease of 42% in your workload, or 700 million, 700 million hours of work saved, I mean. These are the three reasons why you should adopt SaaS taking everything off the table. And as a small business specifically, and more specifically as a women and minority owned business, we have to, we have to get off the sidelines and start using some of these platforms that are doing their best to even the field. The great thing about a lot of these technologies is that they are free. And if they're not totally free, they have a free version, and the paid version is somewhere between 15 or 10 to $15 a month. So they're not terribly expensive. One slide that's not on here that I will go ahead and tell you just to kind of give you an idea about the cost. In my company, we use 25, at last count, 22 actually different SaaS platforms. And we only pay $161 a month. And that's because the free version of most of those platforms is good enough for what we need them to do. So let's look at the App Store. Um, and I say App Store, there's no App Store for, for SaaS technology or, or normally when you hear the App Store, you think about your iPhone. Now you can find all of these apps in your iPhone uh, all of these technologies in your iPhone app store, but I'm using the app store just as, as a way to talk about the the technologies you're going to see on the, on the next slide. So for those that have seen this presentation, this is definitely one sided slide that you've seen before. And here what I have listed are all SaaS apps that were built on the backbone of the internet. I want to pause here first because I use the word internet. And normally when I talk about the internet, the, one of the questions I normally get is, well, what about the security? People are afraid of passing sensitive information across the internet, across the internet because of security reasons. Completely understandable. What I always tell people when I speak is, you may not realize it, but you've been using the backbone of the internet for at least two or three decades. When you go to the ATM and you take money out, 
every code that you put in, every code that you put in is passed along some type of computer network. Um, when you give your social security number, when you type it into um, something at the store, that information is passed along some computer network. The difference is now some of those same technologies have been made known to us. I always tell people, get comfortable with the cloud. The security of the cloud, I'm not going to tell you that breach is done. But these companies you see on your, on your screen right now, they have some of the security technology behind them that you can get when it comes to the Internet. These companies have been tested. There are certain type of security uh, protocols that they have to pass before they can even release their technology into, in, 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 into the world. So get comfortable with that. Security should not be the reason why you do not adopt fast platforms. Here you have on the seventh screen, the ones I'm not going to touch on today, I uh, will briefly mention um, right now would be unroll.me. I want to mention that one real quick um, because a lot of people, when I mention this one, a lot of people immediately go up and sign up for it. And so let me tell you what unroll.me is. We all get email newsletters, and we wonder how did they get my email address. And our inbox get inundated with emails every day. And normally we don't have the time to go into our email box and unsubscribe from all of these newsletters that we get. Well, there's an app for that. Unroll.me is a technology that you can use. All you have to do is go to their website, plug in your email address, hit submit or whatever it is. <clears throat> it's going to go out, find every email newsletter that that particular email address is signed up for. And in one click, you can unroll from every single one of those newsletters. Or you can choose which ones you want to continue to get and unenroll from the rest. Uh, I want to mention that even though that's not business related, I kept it on here because I thought it would be helpful. The second one I want to mention that's on here is um, x.ai. It is the little blue X at the bottom of the screen. That is artificial intelligence or AI. The website is literally x.ai. This one kind of gives people goosebumps, but it is my virtual assistant. It's not a person. It's literally technology. And I give you an example. So if Dale, who you see on the screen, if Dale emails me and says, hey, I want to get together for lunch, I'm going to respond to Dale, and I'm going to copy Amy, and I'm going to ask Amy to set up some time but Dale and I to get together for lunch. At that point, I step away from the conversation, and Amy, who is not a real person, Amy is actually x.ai, is going to communicate with Dale to schedule that lunch for me. That is a piece of new technology that helps me with my time, because the one thing I don't want to do is get stuck in a back and forth with Dale on matching up our calendar. It happens to everyone. And so the way that I cut down on that is use artificial intelligence to help us schedule that. So those are the two on this screen that I wanted to point out because they're not part of the actual four categories I'm about to touch on here in a few minutes. But I want to point them out because I do believe that they can help increase your productivity. So what are the four areas we're going to touch on today? We're going to touch on the cloud, communication, pro product and time, or project and time management, and then business development. Those are the four areas we're going to touch on today. And as you can see, uh, under each one of those bullet points, I have a particular piece of technology that I've pulled out that I think you can use, or I know you can use, and I'm, let me not say think, I know you can use to help your business run better. Now, I do want to say this up front. I do not endorse any of these technologies. I'm not getting paid by putting them on the screen. So that's not the reason why they are up there. That being said, I have used every single one of them. Some of them I, I currently do not use, but most of them I do. Next slide, Jerry. So where do you start? Um, 
I think the most logical place to start is what the next slide is going to talk about. Before you can really get comfortable with using a lot of the technologies that I'm mentioning, you have to start with adopting the cloud. And that's what this slide is about. Some of us use G Suite. Some of us use Microsoft, I think it's 365. Uh, I've never used Microsoft 365, but I use Microsoft if I have a laptop, right? Um, but I want to focus on G Suite. And G Suite is a, a completely cloud-based product that offers different type of uh, platforms under communication, collaboration, organizing, and engage. Uh, I have been a user of G Suite for at least eight years now, so I've seen it, from, you know, from the times I got frustrated with it and wanted to throw it out the window to the times today where I can't live without it. My whole business is ran through G Suite, the cloud. I do not have a laptop. I'm actually doing this presentation right now from a Chromebook, a Google Chromebook. The only thing I can do with a Chromebook is get on the internet. I don't have apps on here. If I want to access an app, I have to go to the internet. So I use a Chromebook. Chromebooks do two things for me. They cut down on the, 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 the time that I use not doing work that I shouldn't do because all I can do is access my G Suite and other internet websites. But then, too, they cut my cost. A Chromebook, you can get a good Chromebook today for around $200 versus a laptop for about $800. So I use Chromebook. My entire company and all of my employees, they have Chromebooks. But talking about G Suite, so the reason why I put adopting the cloud first before we get into other technologies is because every technology that we talk about is ran on the cloud. Every technology from this point forward that I talk about is ran on the cloud. A lot of people say, I want to go back to a point I said earlier. A lot of people say, well, I'm not comfortable with the cloud. If you send an email, and my assumption is everyone on this call has sent an email, you use the cloud, right? If you use an app on your phone, you're using the cloud. If you're on Facebook, I, I'm, I'm going to assume that I'm maybe the only person, maybe some other, others, but I know, I'm, I know I'm an outlier. I've never been on Facebook. <clears throat> But I know most people are. If you're on Facebook, you use the cloud. And we see the type of sensitive information that goes on on Facebook. So there's a level of comfort. If you're on Facebook, there's a level of comfort you already have with the cloud. You need, I need you to transfer that level of comfort over to your business. That's what I want you to do. So under G Suite, I'm going to walk through these real quick. Not all of them, but the ones I think are very important to you. Um, you have Gmail. When I use Gmail for my business, when I send Mark an email, when I send Jared an email, I, you, I send it through Gmail, but it comes out on their end as if I'm sending it for my business. Um, so I use Gmail on the back end to run all of my emails through. Right next to Gmail, you have Google Docs, a Google Drive. And under Google Drive is where everything else after that, that triangle, everything after that is within Google Drive. So you have Google Forms, Google Sheets, which is, which is the equivalent to Microsoft Excel, um, Google, um, the PowerPoint, the next one is Google PowerPoint. It's not PowerPoint, but I can't think of the name, the official name for the Google PowerPoint app. And then right below that, you have Google Docs, the blue one on the second row at, to the right. Is Google Docs. Google Docs is the equivalent to Microsoft Word. All of these are ran through the internet on the cloud. And the great thing about this is I can create any Google Sheets, Google PowerPoint, or Google Docs um, document through G Suite. And if I want to email it to Mark, if I want to email it to Dale, I can email it to them in Microsoft format. If they don't have G Suite, I don't have to worry about that. I can actually email it to them in Microsoft format. Now, if you would have asked me that five years ago, I would have told you that wasn't possible because it wasn't. And that was one of the reasons why I used to want to just hang everything up about Google. But today, no matter which one of their applications you use, 
you can email it to someone in the equivalent of Microsoft. And when they respond, it'll come back to you in the equivalent of your G Suite. So adopting the cloud is critical to our business, particularly in this COVID, this new normal COVID-19. We've got to get to the point where we adopt the cloud. So let's get into team communication and meetings. Um, I put Slack up here. A lot of people may already use it. If you don't know what Slack is, some people may use, I think it's called Microsoft Teams which is an internal communications platform for Microsoft. Um, Slack is kind of the new kid on the block. It's been around you know, probably seven or eight years now. Of course, it's a Silicon Valley company. Um, very easy to use, but it is a communication tool. that I, It's the only communication tool that I use now, whether you're internal at my company or external. It is the only communication tool, messaging tool. Let me let me clarify, not communication. It is the only messaging tool um, that I use when I'm communicating, definitely internal. And depending on the client, more than likely external too, it is what I use. It is a very simple to use messaging platform where you can connect it to G Suite. You can upload documents. You can work in real time with with your clients, you can work in real time internally and collaborate with your team members. And the great thing about it is it's free. And one, that's one thing you will see in everything that I say today. Everything that I am going to talk about has a free version because I am a big fan of free, especially when we need to cut costs and we're trying to grow. Doesn't mean you can't pay for more bells and whistles, but I believe that the free version of just about every platform is, is efficient enough for small businesses to use um, and, 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 and just as good as the bells and whistles. The reality is, I'm, let me say something about this real quick. The reality is normally when you pay for the paid version, you're getting more than what you really do, what you really need. You're really paying for a lot of features that you don't need. So always stick with the free version. So right next to Slack, we have Zoom. Everyone knows Zoom, so I'm not even going to go into detail on that. We're using Zoom right now. Um, Zoom hasn't been around that long, but they've come out as the big winner uh, in the last five months. But a lot of people don't know that you also have Google Meet, and it comes with Gmail. So if you have, G, if you have Google Suites or, 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 or Google Drive, Google Meet is, is the equivalent to Zoom. Um, I use Zoom, I would say, even though I'm on G Suite, I use Zoom uh, probably about three-fourths of the time that I'm doing a meeting like this. But Google Meet is just as good as uh, Zoom, and a lot of people overlook it. There are a host of other communication tools that exist. Um, if you go to my blog, I would say I actually probably two weeks after we went into what they call the saver at home orders. I wrote a blog um, and I listed, I think, six communication tools. And I did a com comparison on all of them just so that you would have an opportunity not to just get sucked into one, but, but choose the one that's best for your company. So if you want to look at some more than Zoom and Google Meet, go to my blog at salescocktail.com and go back, I don't know, maybe four or five blogs ago and you'll see six different um, communication tools that I wrote a blog about so you can choose the best one for you. Business development. This is the biggie. So we're all stuck in the house right now. We, we, the only thing we can really do is have a meeting like this or pick up the phone. We, it's very hard for us to, to kind of go to lunch, go to dinner, go to happy hour, go to conferences where we can shake hands and, and, and meet in person. Uh, that being said, sales does not stop. There are a lot of companies that are growing through this pandemic. And there are a lot of companies, unfortunately, that are dying through this pandemic because they haven't shifted. They haven't embraced tools that allow them to continue to be on the radar of prospects and potential clients. Um, I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. If you've heard me present before, then you know that I will always tell you, LinkedIn, even though it's a social network, it is the most unutilized, underutilized social network there is businesses. It is the number one social network for businesses, but yet most small businesses do not use it. And I don't think it's out of fear. 
I think it's because they don't have the tools to use it. I have a um, blog. When I say tools, I don't think they 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 know the best use case of using it for them. That's the best way to put it. Uh, and once again, I will mention I have I've written something up on this before for MBN USA Magazine. I wrote up an article on I think it was nine tips, best ways to use LinkedIn to grow your sales. Um, I can send that. Here, if they want to send this out, I can send that article, and they can get that out. But when it comes to business development, make sure that you're on LinkedIn. Number one, make sure that you have a profile. It's amazing to me how many people don't have a profile on LinkedIn even today. Make sure your profile is complete, and make sure that the network that you build on LinkedIn is intentional. Be very specific, not about just the people that you connect with, but the groups that you join. And that is one area of LinkedIn that is really underutilized. Everyone in here is a subject matter expert. There is a group, multiple groups on LinkedIn for your expertise that you should be participating in. It's a great way to get clients, and it's a great way to build your network. The second one on here is reply. A lot of people have never heard of reply. Reply is an email automation application. When I say email automation, do not think email marketing. It's not email marketing. Reply is, is literally a, a, um, a app that I use to automate how many emails I can send per day to my sales database or my prospect database. So I'll give you an example. I'm here on this call with you all right now. And as I'm speaking to you, Reply is sending one email every 90 seconds to someone in my email database. Now, the email that they're getting is not an email marketing type of email. It looks like an email that I'm sitting here typing up right now that's coming from my Gmail or from my company email. So if Mark was to get it, he wouldn't know that that email was coming from a piece of software. He would have thought that I just typed it up and sent it to him. So why is that important to me? So I have a database of over 55,000 prospects. It's impossible for my team to reach out to all of those prospects. So we use Reply. Every team member uses Reply, and every day it sends over 200 emails on behalf of every team member in our sales database. Now. All we're looking for is a reply, as as the title you know says. All we want them to do is reply to us. We want to get them in a the conversation. They can reply with one or two one or two ways. They can reply and say, "Hey, I'm not interested." And if they do that, it will stop emailing them. If they reply and say, "Yes, I want more information," well, guess what? Now they're going to my sales funnel. So here we are, my team. We are working from home. Um, these days, like most people, and Reply is helping us increase the number of touches that we get in our email database. Now, we were using it before COVID, but we're definitely using it now, and we plug it into LinkedIn when we're sourcing for new opportunities in LinkedIn. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you exactly what our funnel looks like if the pictures pop up. May have to push to one more. There we go. So everything is about sales, right? And when you email someone, or when someone emails you, the best. Well, let me back up. When someone emails you, the best thing you can do is follow up with them if it's a sales email. So what you're looking at here is what I call my dominoes. So if you go to my website, you give us your email and mail much, two things are going to happen. Your email is going to be kicked over the type form, which is going to send you a survey so we can find out more information about you. At the same time, your email is going to be put in MailChimp so you can get out weekly.
complete newsletter. After those two actions are triggered, two more actions are triggered. Google Forms, I think you can barely see it, but the purple, the purple form at the bottom, your name's populated in Google Forms. Google Forms is going to send your information up email, saying you got a new sales lead. All of that takes place from one action from you. And that one action is you enter your email on my website saying I'm giving information. I get a new sales lead. This is an example of how I use technology to make my business more efficient and to scale the actions that I can take by being just one person. I'm duplicating myself. Is literally what I'm doing. Now I don't have to stay in front of my email, my inbox all day. And we all know we could get sucked into email all day long. I don't want to check my email all day. Matter of fact, I only check it twice a day at lunchtime or in the morning, at lunchtime, and then right before I leave. And if I check it in between those three times, it's because this right here on your screen is taking place. I've gotten a sales email that has come through that I need to respond to fairly quickly before I lose that sale. This is my example for sales or business development. Next slide, Jerry. All right, productivity. Uh, this is the last of the, the four areas that we're going to touch on, and then we're going to move into Q&A not too soon after this. So productivity. You don't see the name, but that blue box right there, that is a software called Trello. Project management is what it's used for. It's a free tool. If, you're, you, if you know what a Kanban board is, that's what Trello is. Uh, my team, any project that we're working on, it is logged in Trello, and I can follow where they are with that project. I don't have to pick up the phone. Um, I don't have to send them an email. I just log into Trello. All of our projects are listed there with what person is working on that project and at what stage they're in with that project. I can communicate with my team through Trello. I can upload documents. Um, through Trello, I can share a lot of other, I can create workflows through Trello where if action A takes place, it automatically triggers action B, C, and D. And if D takes place and it needs to skip, it'll do that. So that's what Trello is. It is a productivity app that you need to have in your arsenal during these times and after these times because it helps you keep tabs on where you are with your projects internally and externally, and you don't have to be in the same room with everyone. And I don't see us being in the same room with a lot of people anytime soon. So you need something like this so that you can keep tabs on what's taking place. And then the last one is toggle. And if you, if you recall, that second question that I put up in the um, – survey that I did to my small database of 35 people, the one technology or the one thing that got the highest clicks was time management. That was the one thing that out of the 35 people who, who responded, 60-some percent said time management was their biggest issue. So I do what I call time budgeting. I won't go into that today for sake of time. But I use Toggle. I want you all to know I use Toggle as the software to manage my time and to manage my team's time. It is a, I forget, but QuickBooks has the equivalent to this. I forget the name of it. I think it's T-Sheets is the name of it for QuickBooks, uh, but I use Toggle. It is a great time management tool. The second tool that's not up here that I want to mention is called Pomodoro. So if you get a Pomodoro clock, uh, Pomodoro clock is, is a way of working in 30-minute increments, and it increases your productivity and your focus. Pomodoro is P-O-M-O-D-O-R-A, -P Pomodoro, and that's not up here. Uh, but Pomodoro is what I use along with Toggle, one, to track my time, to get my reports, but then two, to increase my focus and stay on track with the projects that I'm working on. So I work in 30-minute time increments, and I use Pomodoro to track that for me and for my team. So in wrapping up, um, we're about to open it up for questions, but in wrapping up, technology is king these days. We say cash is king. Technology is king these days. And I'll, give you an ex I, I'll put it to you like this. If you've been paying attention to the stock market, you have the S&P 500, 
you have the NASDAQ, and then you have the Dow. Of those three, there's only one of those that has hit record highs since the pandemic hit us. The Dow is down from its all-time highs, and the S&P is down. The NASDAQ is up. The reason why the NASDAQ is up to an all-time high, and no one predicted this, but the reason why is because the NASDAQ tracks what? Technology stocks, because technology is being used more than ever today by businesses like ours to grow, to cut costs, and to become more operationally lean. And if we, in, we as MWBEs, if we want to grow and remain competitive, we've got to adopt SaaS technology in our long-term strategy. By now, Jerry, yeah, by now you should have received on your phone a text back. If you text sales cocktail to that number, you should have received a, a response on your phone. If you didn't, text it again and it should come to you. If you did, enter your email address and this entire presentation that you just saw will be emailed to you. Jared, we can now open it up for questions. Mark, you're on mute. Mark, you're still on mute, Mark. There you go. All right, sorry about that. Uh, we have a couple questions. Uh, one question is, um, we want the, the text number again, which you all see on the screen. It's 615-510-6364. Um, uh, one question for you is, there, is, all of the great business schools can become undermined by poor training of those tools. How can businesses be sure to get the needed training in order to maximize the benefits of the new technology? Great question. So uh, in the presentation that I did last year, I answered that question because that is one of the best questions. Um, and what I say in that presentation is you have, to, you have to do an assessment of what your number one goal is. Before you even choose any technology, you need to do an assessment of what you're trying to accomplish so you can know what technologies you need to look at potentially using. I always recommend, if you don't, I'm going to answer that question in two ways. One is with training and one is without training. Without training, I always tell people, do not adopt more than one technology at a time. Find out what your, your biggest need is, identify the technology that's going to help you solve that need, and spend at least 30 days using that technology every business day so you can become very comfortable and proficient in that technology. If you try to onboard yourself into two technologies at the same time, it's information overload, you lose interest, and you get frustrated because you're trying to learn. It's like learning two different languages at the same time. And for, some, for most of us, that's just hard to do, and in a lot of cases, impossible. So if you're not going to go through any form of training, make sure that you, you spend at least 30 days on each technology before you bring another one on. Now, in the training world, most of these technologies have video tutorials that come with them. You can go to YouTube for most of these companies and pull up a video tutorial about how to use their software. That's one way you can get formal training. The second way is on their um, website, a lot of them have, it's not what we call focus groups, but communities of use where you can pose a question and you can get real, not the real time feedback, but people will, will respond to your question, helping you understand or better understand whatever your question is about. And then the third way is um, in some cities, like we have them here in Nashville, uh, we have focus groups where you can attend a focus group about technology and some people in there can help you with that platform. So those are some of the ways that, that I recommend. But you can, if you don't go to a focus group, you can always find videos on YouTube or on the company's website that will walk you through how to use that technology properly. And like I said, only use it for 30 days straight before you try to use a different one. 
Great, thank you. Uh, we have one last question. Um, we have, um, what is the exact name of the Reply app? Reply.io. Reply.io. Great. Yes. Thank you so much. Well, you know, Lashane, thank you so much for your presentation. You know, I took some things, some notes, and uh, really my five takeaways are the reasons we should adopt uh, fast technology to stay competitive. Really, you said it increases revenue, it saves work hours, it decreases workload, um, it's cheap, and above all, uh, we need to adopt these uh, these uh, strategies uh, to get off the sidelines and, and even the playing field. Is there any other uh, one that you think that I should add to that list? I don't. I think you pretty much summarize it. I just want our my fellow MWBEs to understand that the world is changing and, and this pandemic has accelerated how much the world is changing and how fast it's changing. Um, I'm sure Dale is going to have some stats or some numbers about how it's impacting us a lot, much more greater than our counterparts. Uh, but the world is changing very rapidly, and this is something we never expected, and we need to start looking at software to help us in, 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 in being competitive. Great. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, and uh, we appreciate you, uh, uh, you know, uh, all the information that you gave me, and we certainly want to uh, uh, work with you uh, in the future. So thanks Thank again. You. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, you know, next up, you know, we uh, with all that's going on, we have a message from the mayor. Uh, you know, our council is partnering with the city uh, to uh, help our minority businesses in the community. So we have a uh, short uh, message from the mayor. Hello everyone, I'm Mayor Lori Lightfoot and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the 53rd annual Chicago Business Fair. This event and its entire affiliate network of councils have a long and proud history of serving as catalysts to developing the critical partnerships needed between the minority and majority owned companies and government agencies, particularly our small businesses. I want you all to know that we are doing everything we can to support Chicago's entire business and entrepreneurial community during these unprecedented times. This year's theme of connecting the dots is especially appropriate. It's in this time where we are all seeing the true value of partnerships and collaboration. To build our networks and businesses in ways that allow all of us to weather any storm, but more importantly, grow to greater heights than any of us have ever seen. A big part of this comes from supplier diversity in both the public and private sectors, with organizations such as the Chicago Minority Supplier Development Council, giving all of us the flexibility and depth we need to serve our businesses, communities, and customers, while also igniting the wealth of talent and services that exist across each and every one of our 77 communities. We've all been through a lot this year. And the truth is, we still have a long way to go. But we are known as a resilient city, a broad-shouldered city, and a city that works because of these moments when we come together, both as a business community and willed ourselves to overcome adversity and continue to succeed. We stand together and say, we will rebuild, we will restore, we will reopen, we will invest, and we will transform into the great city where every business is thriving and every family and every child knows that nothing stands in the way of their dreams. I'm optimistic about our future because everything we need is right before us. And I look forward to working with all of you in creating that future in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you and enjoy the 53rd annual Chicago Opportunity Business Fair and be safe. Well, we want to thank the mayor, uh, uh, Lori Lightfoot, for, for the, taking the time for that video with everything that's been going on. Uh, you know, we really appreciate her time. Uh, so with that, we're going to pivot to our next speaker. Um, and he's going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on mi minority businesses. Uh, Del Gines, uh, he is a senior community development advisor for the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. 
He's committed to helping uh, empower economically distressed communities through innovative economic development strategies. He's a national thought leader in entrepreneurship led economic development and ecosystem building. He has authored four guides and one ebook on the subject. His most recent work is a research report on black women businesses. Dell also is a well traveled speaker, speaking in over 18 states and 45 cities during his 10 years at, at, at the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. Uh, Dell is one of, of less than 5,500 certified economic developers and holds a Master of Business, Master of Science and Finance, and will complete his PhD in public administration in the fall of 2020. During his career, he's received numerous commendations for his work in the community, including receiving the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City President's Award two times, the Community Healing Network Award for Grassroots Community Service, the Kansas City Top 100 Influencers in Technology, the 10 Outstanding Young Omahaans Under 40 Award, University of Nebraska Omaha Chapter National Council of Negro Women Award for Outstanding Community Service. And in 2020, he was inducted into the Kansas City Black Achiever Society. So it's my pleasure to welcome Del Gines. Thanks, Mark. I, I must have gave you the super long bio. I thought I gave you like the Twitter version. Um, but it's good to be with everybody again. Like Lashane, um, some of you may have heard me speak before, you know, on the importance of, you know, minority-owned businesses. But I just, before I get into my presentation, I just want to reinforce, um, you know, Lashane's point that that's literally probably the fourth time I heard that presentation. And in fact, the first time I heard him share it is actually I was in Chicago physically at the Chicago Fed. And it was that impactful that I had him come to the Kansas City Fed to do that same presentation. Um, COVID-19 and the pandemic and what it's done to the economy has shown that, um, you know, minority contracting or businesses and minority businesses in general, uh, small business owners of color, what we call them, cannot afford to not be tech enabled. You have to be able to position yourself through the technology that we have available to be more nimble, more efficient, you know, penetrate the market, acquire more market share. And he has done one of the pr best presentations that I've ever seen on it. And every time I listen to it, I get inspired to go back and kind of learn new technology, be more efficient, figure out how to put, you know, better processes in place. And in fact, there's probably now three or four of those technologies that I use based upon his presentation alone. So I encourage you, I know he has a video out too, um, of the longer, you know, presentation, if you have not heard it, I encourage you to go check it out on YouTube and, and really look through it and, and kind of start doing a, a, an analysis of your firm and see what ways you can leverage technology and cloud-based technologies to become more efficient um, for your business. Um, I'm going to go ahead and begin to share my screen. And I want to make sure I get, get you to the right one. Okay. So I, I pulled this, uh, you know, presentation together because it's important for us to have a context for, you know, what is going on in the, the economy now as it relates to minority firms. And I'll be, be blunt up front, it's, it's, not, it's not good. It's, it's not good. And I think it shows that we have a lot of work to do, which is why supplier development councils, among other organizations, are very important, you know, to the fabric of the nation and the support of minority-owned businesses. Um, before I start, I do have to say the views don't necessarily represent the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City or Federal Reserve System. Um, they are my own, but I believe a lot of them are supported by us. So I do want to start by kind of giving you an overview of the Federal Reserve System. We're composed of 12 banks and the Board of Governors. Um, I'm from Kansas City, which you can see, and of course Mark is from Chicago, and I'm sure most of you are from his district as well. Um, but we, we're regional for a purpose. We're regional so that we can be engaged with organizations and businesses like yours and like your council and so that we get a sense of what's going on in our our community so it's very difficult for example from someone from the new york fed to really understand what's going on in chicago it's very difficult for people to understand in chicago what's going on in kansas city i'm actually from our omaha branch and so we take it seriously um the regional side of it and i do want to talk about some of the work that we've done that you can go and look at a little bit more. Um, we recently released the uh, Building Entrepreneurship Ecosystems in Communities of Color. Uh, and we feel that's an important work as we look at the economic development side of improving, um, you know, small business owners of color. What's the environmental context? What's the development strategies that need to be put in place? And I think everything that I'm going to show you today 
um, at least in the work that we put out, is even more important now once you see the data that's behind this. Um, and this is particularly important because as we move forward as a nation, it should cause us as, as um, small businesses of color and non-small businesses of color and policymakers, what have we done wrong to the point where our small businesses that are people of color have been so disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic? What can we do right in the future and how do we accelerate it so that we make sure that you know, we're, we're pursuing racial and ethnic um, equity within our businesses. And so this guide is a great primer for that. Uh, Mark referenced the fact that I, I um, released the Black Women Business Startups Report, which is a research report we, that we did on Black women, which is the grow, fastest growing group of entrepreneurs. I'll touch on that briefly in a minute. Um, and then some of the other work that we've done in the space that are useful for policymakers and folks that are interested. And all of these you can grab um, from the website at kansascityfed.org. If you go to the community tab, you can find the small business section and it'll pop right up. With the Black Women Report, we got some, some excellent videos on there of interviews with Black women talking about their experiences and things of that nature. So let, let's get into it. And I titled this, this um, slide, The Struggle is Real. <laughs> and many of you may be familiar with that, that term. A lot of our kids use it now, depending on how old you are. The struggle is real. Um, the first quantitative research report came out um, probably a couple weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, done by Robert Fairley. And he's probably the foremost expert on minority entrepreneurship research. You know, he's worked, done a lot of work with the Atlanta Fed. And he basically looked at the data between February and April of 2020. Released, this report was released in the probably early to mid-June. And what he showed is that, is that during that period, 41% of all black businesses had their doors closed at that point in time. That's nearly one out of every two. That's pulling close to 50% of them. 32% of our Hispanic businesses, 26% of our Asians, 17% of our white owned businesses, 25% of our women owned businesses and 36% of our immigrant groups. The impact of COVID-19 is probably unprecedented in the history of America from a few, few standpoints. First of all, the impact is primarily due to the fact that of, of how fast it occurred. So I remember I was actually speaking at Harvard in Boston the, right about the week that everything started getting shut down. And so this would have been March 8th, if my memory serves me correctly. And I remember as soon as I got home, uh, my bosses were calling me and they were saying, hey, where have you been? What have you, what airports have you went through? We may need you to stay home. Um, the Monday following that would be the 11th of something. They said, everybody's going home. We'll figure out a work from home arrangement. And we've been home ever since. You know, and then from that time period, you started seeing this consistent stay at home orders of, you know, or business closures or social distancing all of these factors, and this all happened within really probably a three to four week period of time where the economy, which was pretty much doing fairly decently, all of a sudden had the brakes put on it. People didn't know what was going on. Doors were shut. Um, only essential workers were allowed in many of our states to, to be able to participate uh, in, the, in the workforce. And then if you could go digital and you could go you know, online, people begin to pivot on that and like Lashane said, you know, businesses that were already taken able were better able to, 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 you know, weather the early storm. You had this run of, of the CARES Act and you had the PPP, um, which I didn't put in this slide, but that was problematic for minority entrepreneurs as well. There was some difficulty in, in being able to access that EIDL money all through the SBA and the CARES Act. Um, and all of this happened in such a short and compressed period of time that, it was very, very hard on businesses that were in certain industries in particular. Um, if you weren't, didn't have a business in what was considered an essential industry, worker industry, the likelihood of you, you having to close your doors or having a huge client drops were, were, were large. The, if you were in a tech-based industry, you, you had a better chance you know, to survive. But by and large, this is what is reflected in these numbers. And I think this is important to learn, uh, important for us to understand because we have to begin to prepare for you know, the recovery side of it. So this is the actual total numbers of businesses that had closed during that time period. And so as you can see, almost half a million black businesses closed 
in a three month period of time. Um, you know, obviously there was more white owned businesses. So 1.8 million of them closed. When you look at your black um, businesses, your Hispanic businesses and your Asian businesses as a total number, you're looking at close to 1.3 million um, small business owners of color that have sh that shut their door during a three month period of time, which again is unprecedented in the history of the United States. So I want to kind of shift pivots and and kind of say why you know small business owners of color are important. So from 2014 to 2016, small business owners of color uh, were created 11 per, uh, total percent. They grew by 11 percent. So non business non businesses of color only grew by 1 percent. Now I'm sure most of you are familiar with you know what is projected to happen in American demographics up to 2050, where America is anticipating to be a majority minority um, nation. You know, the Latino population is expected to grow substantially while the white population is projected to grow. And you're also gonna see an uptick in the Asian population and, and a slight uptick in the African-American population during this time period. So we can't really understate the value that minority firms are gonna play into the United States economy. We know that young growth firms produce about 60% of all the net new jobs of any race. So when you take what we consider young and rapidly growing firms, they're, um, they're producing the majority of net new jobs. And when you look at small businesses as a whole, businesses with 500 or less employees, they tend to you know, have maintain about 50% of the entire workforce in the United States. So if our minority firms, if our small business firms of color are, are dying or declining, that has significant national economic consequences over the long run. Not to mention the fact that um, small business owners of color tend to you know, hire other uh, small business or people of color within their business. Um, the research has shown that and the other factors that they plan on addressing the community. So we need to really figure out how to um, empower our, our firms of color as they come out of this pandemic and into the recovery. And even we need to figure out better ways to support them during the pandemic. And so when we're looking at the pre-existing vulnerability, this is from our, we do an annual survey, of biz, a small business credit survey at the Fed. And this was one of the most recent ones. So as of 2018, these were the firms that expressed that they were at risk or distressed in this um, research report, a research survey that we do. So non-Hispanic whites, 22% said they were at risk, 5% said, said they were distressed. When you look at our black um, businesses across the nation that responded to the survey, and these are all firms with employees, so we're not talking about, you know, the mom, uh, the sol solopreneur that maybe is selling on their own. These are actually firms that employ people. 37% um, said felt they were at risk with 21% saying that they were in a distressed condition. That's one out of every five black firms that were reported on the survey. 23 and eight for, for um, non-Hispanic Asians and 31 percent and 18 percent for your Latino population. So if you look at the fact that your black population and your your Hispanic population, even though their race and ethnicity is a, there's a little difference there, but they compose a lot the largest percent of ethnic minorities in the nation. And you can see that there was vulnerability going into COVID that probably was exact well not probably but absolutely was exacerbated by the pandemic. And a lot of this, when it when we come down to like credit access and um, and challenges, is one of the things that's disproportionately facing our minority firms as well. And so when you look at it, you know, white said that they the firms owners said that uh, thirty percent said they had credit access challenge, um, and fifteen percent had a credit score uh, under six eighty. That jumps up. That credit score under six eighty goes to forty six percent for African Americans, eighteen percent for Asians and 28% for, for our Latino population. That 680 score is generally a benchmark for traditional lending at a banking institution, all else equal. So if you can come in with everything else, if you, if you have a credit score at around 680, you pretty much have accessible financing in traditional institutions. Once you start getting below 680, you're, you're gonna have to start taking out usually riskier credit, which tends to require higher um, you know, cost of utilization through interest rates and other things of like that. So when you look at the pre-existing vulnerability from the firms and then their credit score kind of leads you into this. These are firms that, again, firms with employees that went to, to their, their financial institution and said, I need funds to support my business and grow. 
And this was kind of the results. 38% of white firms received less than half or none of the credit requested. This jumps to 70%-ish of, of black businesses that when they went into the bank and they said, I need capital to support you know, my business, 70% uh, of them are basically seven out of 10 received less than half of what they asked for at the financial institution or none at all. And then the 48% and 54% for Asians. And so we can see, you know, even coming into the pandemic that there was a lot of vulnerability in our minority firms. And those are things that should call, especially in the times of social unrest where these issues are coming to light and we're starting to try to digest and, and try to process these things as a nation our economics is fundamental to, to our society. And when you have so much vulnerability that's been exposed and really magnified during this COVID pandemic for our, for our firms of color, we have to take a long pause and really start saying, what can we do better as a nation to support these businesses? Because they're critical uh, actors in their community and these owners and they're critical drivers of the United States economy. One out of every five businesses in the United States is a, owned by a firm, a person of color. And for us to continue to allow kind of this, uh, this will for ignorance is the best term I can use in terms of how we support them, of how we create a more dynamic environment for our firms of color, to me is, is doing America a, a disservice and is doing our communities of color a disservice as well. So I wanted to, to circle back around to our Black Women Startups Report. So what most people don't realize is that by far black and Latina women have been the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs going back 20 plus, probably 15 to 20 years. Um, between 2002 and 2012, both our Latina women and our African American women each grew businesses by 1 million. And I bet that's a stat most of you have never heard. Like 2 million total businesses between our African American and our Latina women were created between 2002 and 2012. Our minority women as a whole outpaced you know, men business ownership and minority businesses as a whole during the same period outpaced white business ownership. And also, and even though I didn't put it in the slides, the, the minority firms coming out of the last recession in 2008 and you know, going through that, they actually led the nation in the, the rapidity of job increase. So this is what makes the recovery plan and process so important. This is what makes, you know, when congressional uh, actions are taking consideration in terms of stimulus, that they look at how they support minority firms with more of a fine tooth comb. Anecdotally, we heard minority firms received a disproportionately less amount of COVID stimulus funding from the PPP loans, uh, from the EIDL loans. A lot of this was because of how they were structured. You know, we heard issues with um, banks prioritizing larger customers banks prioritizing pre-existing relationships, the confusion that was caused in the marketplace. In some instances, the lack of a culturally competent translation of, of the stimulus money for you know, our minority firms. And, and the list goes on and on. Things that we already knew in the marketplace, again, the light was shined on them. And so now it's a time for us to kind of take a time out uh, as, as an industry, as a financial services industry and say, we need to do better. What do we need to do better to be more flexible, have better policies uh, so that we can serve our businesses better? So you are actually the very first people in the entire nation to hear what I'm about to say now. So we recently sent up to our editors a new guide that we wrote in conjunction with the Atlanta Fed on um, the, the Small Business Owners of Color Recovery Guide. And we basically put together a, and, and prepared and will be releasing and doing outreach on it for policymakers, economic developers and others. Um, what we feel, and when I say we, it's not just the Atlanta and the Kansas City Fed. We actually reached out through all of our outreach calls and we've done a lot of them since COVID began. We did a, que a long form questionnaire from national service providers who support small business owners of color. And we put this guide together to be able to share with our local municipalities and policymakers to say, if you want to do right by minority firms and get them to, to start growing scale as fast as possible, these are some of the high level big recommendations that we have. And of course, there's more to the guide than, than what I'm going to talk about. But for, for you that are entrepreneurs and business owners, especially those that are, of you that are in chambers, those of you that are in positions of boards to influence policy, 
this is where your advocacy, especially coming from you as an entrepreneur, is really going to matter. And so I'm going to go over these in my, my last couple minutes um, just to lay those out there, and then we'll take questions if there's any. So when we kind of synthesized that some of the big recommendations for credit and capital were you got to develop more loan and line products with low um, interest rates or no interest rates even, um, deferred payments, meaning that their payments are not due for six months plus, um, and potentially make these flexible in terms of loan or line or lending, um, you know, the way that you produce them. So not everybody needs a business loan. Some people are going to need lines of credit. So you need those kind of flexible capital products. Um, a big one was the developing of more small business grants or forgivable credit products that do not increase long-term debt burden on small business owners of color. Uh, one of the things that we heard is a lot, of, a lot of minority firms were scared to get the PPP loan, and rightfully so, because they didn't know how the rules were going to affect them over the long run. What did it mean to have a debt forgiven? Is that going to happen? A lot of uh, firms in an early survey that I did said, we don't need more debt. We don't need to be able to have to service more debt. So even if the interest rate is low, if you're putting it on our debt stack in the future, and we don't even know what our client base is going to be, then that's putting us at future risk. And obviously that makes sense. If your client base is declined and you're adding more debt to be able to cover that, even if it's a deferred payment, now you're running the risk of having you know, a debt overload when the business, you know, the economy re reopens and you may not necessarily get your cap, your, your client back to the, at the pace that you wanted. So it was a risk. So looking at more grants, forgivable credit products that reduce long-term debt burden. This is a big one for me as a, especially as a former business banker, I, we need to do a much better job in looking at flexible underwriting standards. Um, you saw the data that I showed before and the fact of how many businesses uh, owners of color got less than what they actually asked for. This is not to say that, you know, anybody that walks in the door should get credit because sometimes that can harm a business more than it helps. But what we do know is that one of the most well-researched things in minority businesses is the deficit and the disparity in access to capital. And a lot of this goes back to how we underwrite these loans. So we need more flexible underwriting standards. We need to look at lowering or eliminating credit score, looking at different forms of credit score usage versus that, that litmus test for loan repayability. We need to look at collateral um, thresholds and, and how we can eliminate that. We know a lot of firms of color in service-based businesses, which tend to have lower collateral as a general rule, and also reduction in down payment and personal guarantees. We know that historical discrimination and, and systemic uh, racism has led to the, a deficit in assets, particularly among our African-American population. So now using that as an entry point into getting a loan is obviously going to be dis have a disparate impact. Um, education and recommendation. We need to, we need to you know, basically get our education and training systems on steroids. We need to make them culturally competent and relevant, accessible in multiple different ways to our small business owners of color. Um, this includes, you know, beefing up our mentoring and service. Uh, organizations like the Supplier Development Council, which I'm going to talk to in a, in a minute, um, you know, need to be empowered to do more work, different times of training and connection, different kinds of social networking and things of that nature. Like Lashane said, the reason I love his presentation so much is, is one of the consensus was uh, from the respondents was that technology training, you got to be more tech enabled. We can no longer afford to be behind the curve on technology in our minority owned firms. We have to be ahead of the curve because that creates efficiency and a marketplace competitiveness that can reduce some of the historical disparities. And we need to ensure education and training programs are both available and accessible. Um, our it's no longer enough to say that we have a program that's available in our, a given community. It has to be culturally responsive. People have to understand what the needs are of the small business owners that are going to be taking these programs and design programs to suit the needs of the small business providers. Some policy recommendations. Again, going back to the council, we have to expand and strengthen government procurement policies for small businesses owned by people of color. Three trillion, I, the research that I put in the guide, three trillion goes through state economies every year. We need to be able to get these government institutions because it's in their interest to figure out how to do a better job of disseminating government procurement dollars into the hands of minority firms. It's no longer enough to just say that you can't find a minority contractor to do something. A lot of it is a structural issue. A lot of it is how they design the contracts 
the relationships between the primes and the subs. And these are things that can be worked out because it's in the long run greater good for the community and the economy of that community to ensure that government spending is spent in a more equitable way, in a way that balances out the local economy. Um, we need to increase subsidies and abatement policies that should be strategically developed. This could be to support a wide variety of support services like education and training, other, other things. People don't realize this. Every year, over $60 billion goes through state governments to give money away or to reduce the tax burden to recruit a company. If you go back a couple, uh, a couple months ago, remember everybody was talking about Amazon headquarters. I believe New York was gonna give them $3 billion in incentives to come. And an interesting thing that a, a governor, a mayor said once, he said, when it comes to big businesses, we roll out the red carpet. When it comes to small businesses, we roll out the red tape. So we should be looking at reducing, you know, giving abatements and subsidies to be able to support the scale up of small business owners of color in their communities. Things like business improvement districts need to be increased where we can create dedicated districts where large concentrations of minority firms and uh, communities of color are uh, so that we can drive revenue capital into those and begin to scale up place-based development. Uh, support recommendations, our communities are not off the hook. Like uh, you, you know me, if you heard me before, I say if you're not, if you're always going to a, a council meeting to be able to get a, a contract from a major corporation, but you're not looking at how to do business with each other, you failed each other. So, but our communities need to buy into this too. So holistic buy local campaigns that focus, focus on purchasing from local SBOCs and peer to peer small business purchasing. You all should be looking for ways to connect with everybody that's on this webinar and say, how can I do business with you if it's possible? And then you, if you have a stronger case for going to a corporation or government entity to get them to do business with you. Continue to improve the local environment where small business lives, adequate childcare, transportation, and then co-create with local small business owners and community a clear and transparent COVID-19 recovery plan. Your customers are going to be scared when the economy opens back up to come into your business. So everything that you can do to get your municipalities to give you clear, consistent, safe public health guidelines, whether it's a partial reopening or a permanent reopening is going to go a long way. Because even if the economy opened up fully today, you're gonna to ha still have a significant number of people that are gonna have a lot of trepidation to go back out into your shop or to see you face to face. And so the, the more clarity that you can get your community to give you in terms of guidelines, public health safety, and knowledge around COVID, the better it will be. And then the last set of, of um, recommendations is really for the providers. So we need to support the providers that support our small business owners, like your supplier development councils and other entities like that. This is important because one of the things that I've heard on numerous outreach calls is a lot of your philanthropic and government organizations are actually shifting funding away from these organizations and more towards direct services. Um, you know, things like food pantries and things of that nature or even support directly to the entrepreneur. Now, the problem is, is that in the short run, we may say that makes sense. In the long run, if you lose organizations like your, your diversity councils, your minority chambers, your local support providers and micro lenders, what you do is make the recovery that much harder to do because these are usually your trusted, culturally competent, deeply engaged organizations. And if we let them die or go by the wayside, the recovery is going to take a much longer period of time for you know our small business owners of color so we need to ensure that philanthropy is is continuing to support them both for the operational budget and the program budget that the, we're increasing contract service agreements and grant funding for these organizations and banks need to step up along with local government and philanthropists to provide loan and equity funds to backstop these organizations that are doing local based lending so that's all I got for you. Um, I, I just do want to be, I want you to be optimistic and I'm going to leave you a historical reference, you know, to kind of give you a little bit of context. So I was talking to somebody today, the 50 years after the Emancipation Proclamation occurred um, in, from reconstruction and into Jim Crow, black businesses created, uh, grew by over 1,150%. The black community coming out of slavery in that, that period of time created 180 black banks and created 180 um, colleges, all within a 50 year period of time of one of the most stressful and uh, 
whatever you want to call slavery, then put a negative connotation on it, uh, oppressive times, this was able to occur. And so while this is a very acute and tough time and a lot of our businesses have struggled and have closed their doors some permanently, there's cause for optimism. When this opens up, if you prepare yourself, if you reposition yourself, if you think strategically, get some good people around your corner, build networks and relationships, stick with organizations like the council and others that can provide you useful information in a, in a relevant and meaningful time period, you're gonna come out of this better than what you went into it. And that's the thing that we need to make this nation more equal. That's the thing that our communities need to ensure that we're safe and healthy over the long run. So you can contact me if you have any questions, if you want me to email you directly your report, and I will turn it back over to Mark in the event that we have any um, questions. Yeah, so if anyone has any questions, and thanks, Dell, for that great information. I really like those recommendations, and uh, I'm certainly going to uh, take it back to our board directors and to the council to really uh, see what programs we need to develop. One of the things, though, I had a question for you. Did your research um, come across, you know, there's a lot of uh, minority businesses that didn't get PPP loans. Um, and I think uh, there's even a group there that um, they weren't even bankable. I mean, they didn't have bank accounts. They didn't have um, things like that. So is there, are there other programs that uh, kind of jumped out at you that we need to do for that? Is it basic financial literacy or, you know, what, what are some of the things at that basic level? Yeah, so, so th this is important. Um, so even for more seasoned business owners, you, you, have to be bank, you have to be bank ready, you know? And I think what we've heard a lot is that, you know, a lot of our minority firms were not bank ready, meaning the things that were required for the PPP loan were not, um, were not there. Like a lot of our businesses couldn't just punch a button and get their financial statements. They had difficulty if they had employees to be able to go back and calculate the numbers. Um, also the issue of banking relationships in general was a challenge because what happened in the early stage of PPP was that banks were, were targeting their largest customers first. Then they were targeting um, small businesses that had larger loans and then it was everybody else. And so there was a queue for it. Some of these major banks were even um, only taking applications by phone and telling people that they would put them in a queue. So a lot of it goes down to your business infrastructure, you know, ensuring that big or small, that you, under, you understand your infrastructure, you keep your systems and processes in order so that when you walk into a bank, um, you, you have what it is that they need and not just a bank, because I, I'm not a, a banking advocate per se. I'm, I'm an advocate of you using the best financial resources for your business. And sometimes that is a bank and sometimes it may not, maybe a FinTech, it may be a CDFI, Community Development Finance Institution or whatever. But all of these you need to do. So if I could tell all my, my diverse, my business owners of color right now, especially my small business owners, because by the time you reach over small business middle market status, you, you probably done a lot of things right. But my, my small business owners, and let's say 100, 100 employees or less, let's even, narrowed down from the SBA definition, it would be two things. One, like LaShane talked about, prioritizing becoming better and more efficient with your tech and tech enabled. You know, leverage those technological resources to drive efficiency and reduce your costs. And two, and this is somewhat related, is have your business infrastructure sound and, and very strong. Those two things, and both of those are process improvement things that support and undergird your business. So by business infrastructure, what do I mean? Your HR policies, your financial policies, your ability to you know, onboard and offboard people, and your sales systems. If you put those two things in place, you're gonna build a strong firm contingent upon the market that you're in and your ability to sell. And a lot of the small business owners that, you know, when we're doing our outreach with the chambers or whatever, they didn't have those things in place, um, you know, to be able to do that. And as a result, you had this disparate impact in the, in the marketplace, getting these PPP loans and EIDL loans. Are there any other questions? Uh, I think I have one that came in, let me, um, it says, would it be beneficial for public and private sector buying entities to operate the same way where public sector agencies do away with personal wealth thresholds 
and private sector corporations embrace set asides in order to create more opportunities for small businesses of color, for color regardless of size. I, in general, I'm going to say I would advocate for that with caveats. So I'll give you an example. So in Nebraska, where I'm from, we actually passed a constitutional amendment that banned being able to do our local governments from being able to do any form of minority set-asides. But I think as a general rule, if corporations want to be good citizens and government municipalities with their spending want to be good citizens and, and this is the thing, and have an eye on the long-term impact that it's going to have on their local communities, then you're going to make every commitment possible to make sure that you have an equity-based um, orientation towards your procurement policy. And if you recognize historical discrimination plays a role in current, you know, you resources provided by a lot of our minority firms, even if we take direct bias out of the equation, then what you would do is you would step back and you would say, how can I use this, this robust power of purchasing in my government procurement processes, and particularly government because they have a social responsibility more so than a corporate corporation. How can I then ensure that to the best of my degree possible, I'm making this accessible to minority firms. And what I've found is that that's not what happens. What happens is they say, we're going to do what is the easiest for us. And then only on the margins, we're going to try to figure out how to support our firms of color. And if it, if it becomes a conflict, oftentimes the easy side wins unless there's a public uproar. But we need to go the other way and say, start with the end in mind. You know, look at issues of bonding, right? Can we figure out a way to do different forms of bonding or protection, you know, of the, the job owner uh, with the prime and the sub? that do not necessarily require su such a level of bonding or even asking ourselves is the level of bonding necessary that we're requiring for this particular contract. Simple things um, that we can do. But if governments truly, state governments truly do have three trillion goals to them every year, how do we get more in, how do we get more of them, uh, more of those dollars into the hands of minority firms, which ultimately get into the hands of minority families and communities and minority employees? Right. Thank we, any other questions? Well, uh, I want to thank you, Dell and Lashane. I think this, uh, I've got some great comments that they uh, really enjoyed. I think it's great information that you've provided. Um, so I really want to thank all of you today for uh, all the speakers. I want to thank Jared uh, for helping us put this together and uh, the Chicago MSDC and the MBIC committee. Um, this is very uh, useful and outstanding information that uh, uh, certainly the council is going to make sure we develop the programs to make sure that we're helping uh, businesses uh, get through this pandemic and also uh, thrive uh, going forward. Uh, so with that, um, tomorrow, I want to tee up tomorrow, we're going to continue um, our business opportunity fair virtual conference in conjunction with Business Smart Week. Uh, we're going to have Jared, he's going to do a uh, presentation on the video pitch with perfection and then um, I'm going to talk about our, our smart business pitch in which we're going to uh, I'll talk about how to do business with the Federal Reserve and then uh, we're going to um, work on uh, getting uh, everyone to do videos with the opportunity that we have available in the, in the Federal Reserve system um, and then we can schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, later on. And then on Thursday, we're gonna have uh, Chandra Watson-Wilson and Letha King do a webinar on strategies for maximizing minority business certification. So we've got some great programming uh, this week. Um, and I wanna thank, uh, oh, then we also have, um, on July 30th, we have Keeping Your Business Secure and Resilient During the COVID-19 Crisis. Uh, we'll have JP, it'll be sponsored by JP Morgan Chase. Um, and we'll have uh, featured speakers of Jill Davis from JP Morgan Chase, uh, Karone Vitell, uh, and then uh, Michael Kelly. And so uh, uh, stay tuned for uh, more programming and we look forward to you joining us. And, and again, thanks everyone for attending uh, our uh, virtual conference. Oh, also, please. Uh, 
fill out a survey. We have a survey that's being sent to you. We want to get your feedback uh, so that we can uh, make sure we bring the information that uh, you want to hear and will find useful uh, and apply to your businesses. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.